Um, so it's my pleasure to um, have uh, um, introduce and have Kevin here talk to us today. So Kevin Shea is from Carnegie Mellon, where he works with uh, Phil Gibbons and uh, owner. Um, he's done some really interesting work at the intersection of systems architecture and machine learning. Um, in fact, he's interned here with Ganesh, Peter, and uh, Mathai. He's worked with all of them. I think Ganesh was his mentor. Um, and he'll be talking about some other work today, uh, both sort of serving systems as well as training systems. And Kevin and I, for some time, have been actually working together now, looking at uh, training models using um, data where you have non-IID data. Um, and I think you'll touch upon that too today. Um, so yeah, we're, we're very excited to have you here, Kevin. Welcome. OK, uh, thank you for the introduction, Amar. Um, so today I'm going to talk about my research on designing machine learning systems for highly distributed and rapidly growing data. Uh, feel free to interrupt me if you have any question. OK, I'll begin the talk with a very quick overview. So as we all know, the explosive development of machine learning has enabled many interesting and important applications, such as face recognition, object detection, self-driving car, language translation, and many, many other more. <clears throat> and the, at the core of these machine learning applications are two key machine learning phases, which are training and serving. So at training side, uh, we usually we typically collect a set of training data and then feed them into a machine learning training system to generate a machine learning model. And then we will feed them into a machine learning serving system to answer questions based on the serving data. Uh, for example, we can train an image classification model based on a set of images. Then we can answer questions such as what type of object is this uh, image? So the key objective of both training and serving are low latency and low cost. Low latency is very important for training because it can typically take hours or even days to train a model. And on the serving side, it's also very important to make it low latency because the serving is usually part of a user-facing service. So the latency will determine the usability of that service. Low cost, on the other hand, is also very important because uh, it determines the user, uh, practicality and feasibility to deploy a machine learning application. However, when we deploy machine learning applications in the real world, we have to pay more attention on those training and serving data. This is because in the real world, a lot of machine learning data are actually generated at rapid speed at different places. For example, many large organizations like Microsoft or Google deploy many data centers all over the world. And many machine learning data, such as images, videos, user activities, are generated at different places. As a result, those machine learning data can be highly distributed and rapidly growing. And they can pose new challenges for machine learning to achieve low latency and low cost. So to give you a more concrete example, uh, let's first look at the serving side and then how rapid growing data affect serving. For example, we can have a lot of traffic cameras in a city that keep recording videos that are rapidly growing. And then we can build a machine learning serving system to answer questions such as, find me the video frames for particular objects such as trucks. So typically, we have two options here. We can do all the processing at ingest time for the live videos, but that will incur high cost because we don't even know if those videos will get queried. On the other hand, we can do all the processing at the, at the quer at query time by the time that we know what, what we are querying for, but that will induce a long latency because all the work are happening at query time. The other example, let's look at training side. Uh, let's say we want to train a machine learning model based on the data that is geo-distributed. When we do this, the training will ha have to happen over this uh, wide data network, which is typically much slower compared to local area network within each data center. As a result, this training can become high cost and incur high, uh, long latency if we do this sort of training over... Yes? No, I was just going to ask, isn't the practice today to get all the data to a place yes, and it is. train it, or do they train it? Uh, um, so centralizing data is, uh, I, I think, more typical way to do it. But there are issues with that. For example, you can, uh, for some data, that's too costly to move them. And also, there were some uh, law constraints, such as data sovereignty law, that you cannot move data out of EU, for example. So there are cases where we will need to do this geo training. Yeah. OK. 
So in this talk, I'm going to talk about the machine learning systems I designed for this highly distributed and rapidly growing data. I'll first introduce Focus. Uh, this is a machine learning serving system that aims to provide low latency and low cost querying for rapidly growing data. And I'm going to use video as a use case. Uh, this is also an intern project that I did uh, with Ganesh, and some of you may already know about it. And the second uh, system I'm going to describe is Gaia. This is a machine learning training system that enable training over geo-distributed data and make it as fast as training within a single data center. And finally, I'll talk about some ongoing directions that I'm doing also with Amar that about training over uh, skilled data sets and also some future work directions. So I'll first talk about the serving side and focus. So. Um, Video is actually one of the most rapidly growing data uh, at this time because we have so many cameras all over the place. We have traffic cameras in cities, we have home cameras, we also have monitoring cameras in retail stores, enterprises. Actually, we have cameras in this room, many cameras here right now. Right? So, one of the key applications that machine learning enables with over this video is that we can query objects in those videos. For example, a city planner uh, can may be interested in all the trucks showing up in a city for a period of time. Or if, say, there's a garage, uh, burglary event happen in a garage, then we may be interested in all the video frames that with people in it. So running those query, we need to use a detector and classifier CNNs, uh, which is usually costly and slow when we have massive videos. I'll elaborate on that very quickly. So one typical approach to enable this low latency query, as I said at the beginning, is we can do this ingest time analysis, which is that when the live videos are recorded, and then we can just run them through those expensive neural networks, and then we generate the index. The inverted index can be object class mapped to the video frames. Then at query time, we only need to look up the query based on the object class that users are interested in to return the frames. This approach will make query very fast, but the downside is it will be very costly. For example, if we use uh, the, a, a recent neural network like YOLO v2, it can cost almost $400 per month per stream. So imagine we have thousands of uh, videos to, to ingest, it will be very high cost. On the other hand, uh, it is also potentially wasteful. For example, the Berkeley event that I discussed at the beginning, uh, if we, only, we, we may be only look, uh, interested in a particular garage video, but uh, at interest time, we wouldn't know which garage video we are interested in, so we have to analyze all of them. That can be a lot of waste. Uh, so the other approach is that we do nothing at uh, ingest time, and then we do all the work at query time. It will save us the cost at ingest time and reduce waste. However, and also, we can further uh, optimize that using frame downsampling, skipping, or using a query up. Uh, query specialized CNN and cascade them with expensive CNN to make it even faster. In fact, there is a uh, state-of-the-art system that's called NoScope that does exactly that. However, using, even using this kind of uh, specialized system for video is still very slow. It's going to take five hours to query a month-long video. So in this work, our goal is to enable low latency and low cost querying over rapidly growing video data sets. In particular, we want to build a system that can uh, process a lot of video streams, and the user only need to provide a, a expensive CNN and the accuracy target, and then at query time, the user query for particular objects and will return the frames. So before, we, yes. Uh, you said five hours for for one plug. All the scenarios you described it seems like that would be an acceptable delay. Yeah, five hours. It, for the scenarios you described, it seems like that would be an acceptable delay. Acceptable delay. Yeah, I mean, doing conducting a police investigation takes days. Uh, doing city planning, planning takes years. <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess it depends on the uh, application. For example, if, if we are, if we are doing some, um, for example, let's say if there is some event happening in the city and we want to look for a particular kind of car or a particular kind of truck, then then the latency requirement will be uh, much higher. And also, just in general, as a service, if we provide a service that takes like hours to run, I think it's just in general not not good for most users. Yeah. So I guess you can also think of building higher level services where an event is triggered, 
and at higher levels of the music. So for example, you know, if there's an accident, uh, detecting that and actually, you know, triggering, say, um, uh, emergency, emergency services to actually be notified and come, right? You, you want it to be low latency as opposed to being long, right? Right. But that would require a month long video. Yes. That wouldn't require a month long video. <laughs> So it depends on the application, yes. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, the, if I have a really urgent query, it's probably over the most recent data, which bounds uh, the amount of data I have to uh, analyze, too. So I probably don't have an urgent query over month-long video, over months of video, right? If I care about an analysis over older video, I can probably wait. All right, maybe you'll get into these, these sorts of trips. Yeah, so I guess, yeah, so it, it it's indeed depends on the application, I agree, yeah. For some applications, it's obviously more latency tolerable, yeah. Okay, so before I introduce the system, I'll quickly go through some uh, key backgrounds of uh, convolutional neural networks. So there are two key aspects of convolutional neural networks that I'm, I'm going to introduce. So the first thing about this uh, classifier neural network is that uh, we can actually see the final layer output is actually the probability of all the possible objects. For example, this input uh, image is a truck. We can actually get the probability of truck, moving van, bus, car, etc. And the other aspect is that the layer before this final output is what we call a feature layer. So this feature layer uh, can be seen as a high-level representation of the uh, input image. Okay, so. Now I'm going to introduce the system we built. We called it Focus. The key idea of Focus is that we enable low latency query with the low cost ingest. Uh, it has three key components in it, and I'm going to cover the first two key components today. So the first key component is that we enable approximate indexing using cheap ingest. So the, the idea here is that instead of using expensive CNN to analyze those videos, we can just use cheap CNNs instead. For example, we can use the CNNs with fewer layers, fewer weights, or the CNNs specialized for each video streams. In particular, when the videos come in, we can extract the frames and objects, run them through, uh, instead of running them through expensive CNN to generate the index, we just replace them with a specialized and compressed CNN to generate the index. But there's a problem with this approach, which is that there's a, there's a reason why those cheap CNNs are cheap, because they are usually less accurate. Uh, to be more precise, let's say with the input image here as a truck, if we compare uh, the output between cheap CNN and expensive CNN, we can see that the expensive CNN is correct, say it's a truck, but the cheap CNN is wrong, say it's a moving van. So to solve this problem, we make an empirical observation, which is that we find that uh, the best results within those, uh, uh, for those expensive CNN is actually within the top K results with these cheap CNNs, and the Ks are usually small. For example, here, if we look at the third output of cheap CNN, we can see that the, uh, the truck output uh, show up. In another word, we can actually use top K results to compensate for the accuracy loss of those cheap CNN. To be more precise, we use two metrics to define the accuracy targets. One is recall. Recall is a fraction of objects we can find from overall population. And precision, on the other hand, is uh, the correct objects we return fraction of the correct objects we return to the user based on the results that we, we give you to user. Let's first look at how we can keep the recall high. So here we study a particular video, and the y-axis is recall, and x-axis is the number of output we select from those cheap CNN. We compare uh, those cheap CNN output, which is based on rest 18 and remove uh, four layers and six layers, to a more expensive CNN as YOLO V2 that can recognize 80 classes. So if we look at the top outputs from those uh, cheap CNNs, the recall is actually horrible. It's actually 50% or less than 50%, so it's actually not very useful. And also, if the cheaper the CNN we go, the lower recall we will get. But the interesting coming out here, so actually if we pick k equals to two, the recall all of a sudden becomes reasonable. Here we get uh, more than 90% of the recall by only pick two results from those cheap CNNs. And if we pick k equals to three or four, we can actually get more than 99% of the recall, which is uh, the accuracy is enough for many applications. In another word, um, those cheap CNNs can achieve high recall with a small type K results. 
But there's a problem of this approach, because when we pick more than one result from those cheap CNN, we will return more results than we need to to the user. So the precision will become lower. So how do we keep the precision high as well? So the solution is we develop a sl split architecture, where at ingest time, we use those cheap CNN to analyze those videos to generate a top K index, again, from object class to object and object to frame. So at query time, when we know which object we are interested in, we find out those objects and map, match the, uh, in the index, and then we run them through the expensive CNN to make sure they are indeed those objects, and then we return to the user. So with this architecture, we still maintain high recall using cheap CNN, and then we, we get high precision by doing some work at query time. And more importantly, those query time work is only done with the videos that they are actually interested in, so there are much less waste. The other uh, component is that we, we enable fast query with redundancy elimination. So as we see, we use this approximate indexing approach uh, to do uh, chip ingest, but then introduce non-trivial work at query time. And actually, the larger the K we select, there will be more query time work to do. To solve this problem, we make another observation, whereas we already process all these objects with the chip CNN, so we can actually extract the features from the feature layer of those CNNs. Can you understand how much the difference in cost is between, say, the full CNN and the one with four or six layers removed? Is it 80%, 99%, 12% of it's how much cheaper? Uh, so overall, it can be up to 50 times difference. 50x. Yeah, 50x. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. So we can actually extract those features. And there's a lot of study has established that uh, images with similar feature, they will be visually similar. So we can actually run them through some clustering algorithm. And then so cluster similar objects. For example, here there are the same object with different uh, visual, visual directions, but we can, using this approach, to cluster them together. And then at query time, we only need to run this expensive CNN once per cluster instead of every object. So we can make the query latency even shorter. So to incorporate this uh, clustering in, into our architecture, instead of generating type K index directly from chip CNN, we first extract the features and then run them through clustering algorithms. And then we also get the type K results from the centroid of each clusters. And then at query time, we just pick the clusters that match the querying object, and then run the centroid object through the expensive CNN, and then we will return the frames if they match from all the clusters. Uh, so with this approach, uh, we can reduce redundant work at query time. We evaluate our system using 11 live traffic enterprise videos. Uh, each video is 12 hours. And the accuracy targets we do is 99% recall precision with regarding to expensive CNN YOLO V2. And we compare with two baselines. One is in, the, basically the two that I discussed at the, at the very beginning, ingest heavy, that ingest everything using the expensive CNN and ingest time and store the inverted index. No scope, on the other hand, is a query only system that optimizes heavily for the query. So I understand what you mean by 99% recall precision with respect to YOLO. What, what's YOLO V2? So YOLO V2 is a relatively recent, recent object detector CNN that uh, I think they win some competition for, uh, I think, this image, image net uh, object detection uh, competition. OK, and, yeah. and is it the CNN that you're cutting, that you're using and cutting layers out of? So yeah, so that's the, that's the baseline, okay. essentially. Because yeah. when you showed those numbers before, the, the recall for the full yeah. size CNN was like 55% or something, right? It was not. So, so this is 99% of 55%. I mean, it's not your job to fix the CNN, right? You're not a normal researcher. Oh, so at the beginning, the results I showed is actually the comparison between cheap CNN recall. So the, the baseline. Yeah, but you showed the baseline in there, too, and it wasn't really all that great. Uh, right? You read the green line. If I remember that. No, no, no. I, I think there's uh, the fish. Yeah. No, no, no. For, let me, let well, me go back. Well, you showed Kate was one, but he also showed three things, which is the full CNN. One with four layers uh, on this one. No, no, no. Okay. So maybe I misunderstood this. Yeah, yeah. So this one, so the green one is resonant 18. This is not the baseline. This is already a cheap, cheap, cheap CNN. And then this is remove four layers, six layers. So they are cheaper and cheaper. So there are three oh, okay. cheap CNNs, so, and 
compared with the YOLO V2, that's expensive one. So we, we assume what YOLO, YOLO V2 can get is the ground truth. So okay. I, I agree right. that... You didn't uh, explain that, so I didn't yeah. understand this correctly. Right, right. Okay, so, so even the green one is a cheaper... Yes, it's much, much cheaper. Than yeah, and, and then you made it, you made it cheaper still. Even like cheaper, yeah, right. Okay, so it wasn't that you saved... 50x by chopping out six layers. You say 50x by going to a cheaper neural network in the beginning, correct. then yes. chop. Oh, yes, okay. correct. All yes, right, correct. that makes more sense. No, thank you. Thank you. I can work. Yeah. Yeah. So when you were this slide, I wanted to tell you, hey, people like, might not know what YOLO V2 is and what you're showing here, but um, well, so this yeah, one person you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, right. So, uh, how general is this? So, I, I'm I'm having a hard time understanding how what, whether your example is just an example for slideware or if that this is. So, let's say I wanted to query for all the Toyota Tundras, or mm -hmm. the suspect was uh, wearing a Loyola sweatshirt. Or, would this work? Um, so right now, we we based on object detector CNN uh, that they use more general uh, uh, classes, such as people, or cars, or truck, moving van, stuff like that. But you can imagine, you can train another kind of neural network that can uh, recognize more detailed classes. Or you can even uh, build some service on top of that. For example, you can find cars first, and then do some sort of histogram to find gray car, blue car, uh, like things like that. But but that's not uh, so. In in this particular work evaluation we did is based on uh, YOLO v2 that recognizes general classes. But you so can imagine you can train your network to do. I it. can imagine, but how how well how how, do, how much of your results are an artifact of the fact that you have a limited set of things to choose from and. How how much would the, these results generalize to a much broader set of things that that you might not even have anticipated was were going to be queried? To? Um, that's a good question. So in in our evaluation, we mostly based on YOLO v2, but we also did another uh, evaluation that's based on uh, ResNet 152 that can recognize actually a thousand classes, um, but obviously that's still not. Uh, the precise example that you say, but we sort of try to try to show that it's not just because it's, you, we can only recognize 80 classes, so it's easier. We also do a thousand classes, and we see that it's actually quite applicable to that situation as well. Okay. Um, all right. So let me just quick, quickly go through the end-to-end -end performance. So here. The y-axis is uh, ingest. Uh, sorry, the y-axis is query latency, and x-axis is uh, uh, ingest cost. So ob obviously, the smaller will be better. If we plot ingest heavy here, it will be very high ingest cost, uh, but almost no query latency. No scope, on the other hand, is very high query latency but no ingest cost. If we plot uh, no scope on this uh, figure, it will be here. We also have a zoom-in figure uh, that's with uh, different trade-off options. So overall, we can see that uh, no scope is actually 57 times cheaper on average compared to ingest heavy. You mean focus, right? Uh, focus, yeah, focus. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Sorry. And uh, the query latency, if you compare against no scope, is on average 162 times faster. So now the query will become two minutes for a month-long video rather than five hours. And to, yes? But again, it just seems like if I need to get minutes, uh, Answers within minutes of time. I yep. probably don't need to search a whole month of video. The, it seems like the more likely case is, you know, some some event happened, and I want to look at what happened over the past twenty four hours, or the past twelve hours, or the yes. past six hours. Okay. So, um, how how does your system do if we consider these sort of shorter videos um, or sh shorter periods of time that I want to analyze? Um, so actually, there's an aspect that I didn't have time to cover, this, that is actually we can see it here that actually focus can optimize for different kind of settings. So we can actually, so if, if we don't really care about all that much about query latency, we can actually choose options that optimize for ingest cost. So we can actually pay even smaller ingest cost to achieve uh, what's the latency requirement that we want to achieve. For example, if we, we in general only care about one day or several hours of videos. So we know that uh, we can do the back of the envelope calculation that how long uh, 
basically what's the latency that we the target that we we're going to achieve, then we, we can actually pick uh, even cheaper CNN to do the ingest and then to achieve the latency requirement. But if we use no scope, there is just no such flexibility because there's like this fixed latency and maybe it's okay for certain applications, but it's not okay for other applications. Okay, no scope for mine. That's the one where you do everything at query time. Yeah. Um, and so how many, I mean, how many frames per second are these videos? Uh, so they are recorded at 30 frames per second, but with all the evaluation is done based on one frame per second. Okay. Yeah. So actually just digging one level deeper, right. the question of this graph, particular graph that you're showing, how much data are you actually going through? Uh, 12 hours. 12 hours of data. Yeah. And you're hitting the 99% precision recall targets? Yes. Recall and so that's the answer to the question. The it doesn't cost you anything to do it, so you might as well. And the fact that you get low latency on a query, you're not going to use very much, so why? Uh, might as well, right? I mean, 1% precision accuracy is much better than making any difference. Right. Okay. Um, so to demonstrate the, uh, this system, we actually built a, a demo system here uh, that. Uh, Okay, so this is uh, focus, and here we sh we show an example video that's called Coral. So basically, it's a it's an aquarium, and we can see there are sometimes people showing up and stuff. So if we let's say uh, so there's uh, some um, customers to say that I lost my handbag and I want to find handbag in these videos. So with uh, no scope, uh, there's no pre-processing at ingest time. We can run this query, and obviously. Uh, no scope has to analyze all these frames. So there will be around uh, 10,000 frames each to analyze. It's going to take a while, actually, uh, to run. And so obviously we don't want to, uh, well, we can come back to that later, but it's going to take a while. So, the, so it's running on the server at CMU. Um, yeah, so this is only the web page here, okay. And on the other hand, we can also do focus, which has some pre-processing. Then we can do the same query. Um, but right now, uh, the, we can see that the uh, analysis only need to run over 200-ish frames because we already uh, filter out most of the uh, frames at the beginning. And then we can get those videos come back right away. Right? And you can see that, uh, uh, for example, we can see there are some handbags here. It's a little small. Uh, right? You can see there's this handbag here. Or here, actually. This is where the handbags show up, right? So the, uh, v the, the object detector very accurately captured this, and there's another, another, other examples. You can see uh, handbag, right? And if we come back to this, it's still not, it's not happening. So it's going to take a while, really. Um, so actually, before uh, this talk, I actually run this, uh, the same uh, query with uh, no scope baseline. And we can see that after it's done, it's going to take almost eight minutes to run. Um, and the same results, exact same results uh, with no scope. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Uh, I'm happy to go, go uh, one slide to the left. One slide to the left? Yeah. What's the ratio in, in just cost? Whoa. No, sorry. Uh, you're there. Yeah. Here. What's the ratio? Uh, I'm having a hard time making out the x axis. What's the ratio in cost between focus and no scope? So, no scope is almost, no scope, there's no ingest cost. So, it's, if you want to do the I mean, ratio, it's total it's, cost. Uh, oh, total cost. I don't have the number off the top of my head. I, I believe it's uh, around 20 times difference. Yeah. So, that's the, so that's the cost. That's how many queries you run. Probably does. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, one one you pay on queries, one you pay on ingest. Right, but so 20x might be significant. Okay. <clears throat> um, right. So there's other applications for this as well. Uh, any uh, large and growing data using CNN can use this approach. For example, there are many other video applications like face recognition, emotion detection, scene detection. They can also use similar technique. And audios, we may want to find some keyword with, uh, within the audio. Or bioinformatics, we might want to find certain brain signals uh, with certain characteristics. 
or even geoinformatics, right? We have satellite images. We want to find or track certain objects. Then um, we can also use the similar split architecture that we do some pre-processing at ingest time, so we can save the query time uh, significantly. Okay. I just want to follow up on one of Jay's questions, which has to do with generality, which you're showing on this yeah. slide. Okay. Um, you said that you tried it with YOLO and, and uh, ResNet right. for object detection. That's right. And here, the, at least the hypothesis is that you can extend it to all these different workloads. Correct, yeah. So that's the hypothesis, but have you actually tried it? Uh, even on toy examples, where your techniques actually help help these other scenarios? Mm, no, I have not. OK, so now let's move on to the training side. And I'm going to introduce Gaia. So as I said at the beginning, um, there were times that we want to train a global model by leveraging the data generated at different data centers. So by doing this, the typical approach, uh, as Ganesh has asked, is that we can move the data into one data center before we do the training. However, as many prior work has argued, that this centralizing approach is usually invisible for two reasons. One is that moving those data over wire network can be very slow and costly. And the other issue is that there are some data sovereignty law constraints, like you may not be able to move data out of EU. So the alternative approach is we can do this training over different data centers and we deploy the machine learning system geo-distributedly. However, uh, all this communication has to happen through wider network, and based on our study, it can slow down the system by more than 53 times compared to training within a single data center. So the goal in this work is we want to develop a geo-distributed system that we can minimize communication over a wide area network, and we can return the accuracy and correctness of the machine learning algorithms, also with no change for the algorithms and uh, machine learning programs. So before I go through the solution, I would like to give a quick background of uh, distributed machine learning architecture, in particular the parameter server architecture that has been adopted in many uh, machine learning systems. So from a very high level, we would like to train the machine learning model based on the training data. With this uh, parameter server architecture, we will partition the data into multiple partitions and using different worker machines to handle each partition. And then we can also have multiple parameter servers to collectively maintain the machine learning model weights. At the end of each uh, iteration or mini batch, the worker machine will generate an update to the weights or parameters to the parameter server, and then we will get back to the most up-to-date parameters so we can uh, generate the uh, next, next uh, iteration update. This synchronization is extremely important for the accuracy and correctness of most of those machine learning algorithms. So when we deploy this architecture on wide data network, the most straightforward approach is we can have the worker machines in different data centers to handle the data, and then we deploy the parameter servers in different data centers. However, with this approach, all the communications from local worker machine to remote data centers has to go through wide area network. And as I said at the beginning, it can cause very high slowdown. So to solve this problem, we introduce a system that we call Gaia. The key idea of Gaia is we decouple the synchronization model within the data center from the synchronization model between different data centers. Specifically, we still have the worker machines in different data centers to handle the data, and we have parameter servers in different data centers as well. But the key difference here is that we, in each data center, we maintain a full and uh, approximately correct model copy. Because it's a full copy, so the communication between worker machine and parameter servers only need to happen locally to make progress. And in different data centers, we'll have another approximately correct copy, and we will use another synchronization model here to make sure they are within some acceptable difference. With this approach, we, can, uh, we only need to communicate the significant updates that change to the weights, and we can eliminate the insignificant ones. So to see why this architecture can help us, we study the update significance. So here, we study three machine learning applications, metric factorization, topic modeling, and image classification. So they cover traditional machine learning, unsupervising learning, and uh, more recent uh, neural network learning. So the y-axis here is the percentage of insignificant update, and the axis is that we choose different threshold for the significance. For example, 1% means that if the update changed the weight by more than 1%, we say it's significant, otherwise it's insignificant. 
So as we see, uh, even with, with even we choose a relatively small threshold, one percent, more than ninety five percent of the updates are insignificant which means that uh, because the vast majority of them are insignificant, using our Gaia architecture, we can eliminate most of them. And to make sure that uh, all these parameter servers still synchronize appropriately, we introduce a new synchronization model that we call approximate synchronous parallel. So there are three components here. I'm going to cover the first two. <clears throat> the first part is the sig significance filter, where the worker machine generates updates to parameter server and in the server, we maintain the value and also the aggregated update for that, value, uh, for that parameter. And those updates will keep aggregated into this uh, aggregate update field. And the end of each mini batch or iteration, we will send the value and aggregate update to a significance function to generate the significance of this aggregated update. And then we will compare that with, uh, against the significance threshold. So if it's larger than this threshold, we say it's significant, and then we share them with other data centers, otherwise we'll keep them locally. So the significance function can be as simple as the ratio uh, between aggregate updates to the value. We can imagine that there can be some other more complex significance function. And the significance threshold will have an initialized value, let's say 1%, and we will apply some function to make sure that the threshold gets smaller and smaller over time, so eventually we, all the data centers can see all the updates. And the second component is we call ASP selective barrier. So we need this technique because even though we only send a significance update, they can still arrive too late if. Sorry, how, do, how do I think of how do you set the significance threshold? I know 1% looks like a small value. Right. How about 0.1%, how about 10%? Like, what are the implications? Um, so obviously, if you set the uh, initial significance, uh, the threshold too high, then the training may diverge at the beginning. So it has to be relatively small. And we can, you can find out those thresholds by doing some local, local trial and error, like using the data that locally, and then run Gaia system locally to find out what's the threshold I'm going to use, and then you can apply that uh, geodistributively. So this is then ready for different kinds of training. Yeah, that uh, very varies, uh, yeah. <coughs> Just to follow up, can you, there's a threshold also change over time. For example, if you change some hyperparameters like learning rate, you'll have a learning rate schedule, right? Uh, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, so there's, so, there's yeah. a temporal schedule for that too. Yeah, yeah. So our default schedule is actually we, we change the uh, threshold based on how learning rate changes. Yeah. And do you see that early on, almost update, all updates are considered significant, and then over time, um, most updates are insignificant, so the amount of communication decreases over time as you train. That is true. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, uh, so instead of just sending the significant updates, we actually first send a barrier that tell other data centers that all these parameters are going to have significant updates. So the local workers have to not reading them until the significant updates arrive. So with this approach, we can actually let the workers that are not dependent on those parameters with significant updates to keep going on, and other workers have to wait. So to evaluate this uh, system, we, we evaluate three applications, metric factorization, topic modeling, image classification. We deploy our system on Amazon EC2, and we also use some local cluster to emulate the wide area network bandwidth. We, we also match uh, the performance of our system with a real EC2 deployment. We compare with the two parameter server uh, systems deployed over a wide area network. All the results I show here, they achieve the same accuracy as that we can do it with BSP within a local uh, data center. Expand BSP, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. BSP is the, the, the communication model that I described at the very beginning. They would communicate everything all the time. Okay. So the previous thing I said emulated EC2 bandwidth. Does that emulate the radiation over time as well? Uh, no, no. Yeah, um, but we do check that uh, with the with the emulation that we did uh, compared to the real deployment, that the performance difference is within five percent. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, could you give an example of a parameter that a, a parameter in a worker where the worker doesn't care about that parameter, so the worker can advance? I I don't know anything about machine learning algorithms. So I'm just, just curious. So. Uh, yes, yeah, so there are some uh, algorithms like Lasso 
that uh, it's actually it only care about certain weights that, that based on the data. So for for the, for some data, they only care about part of the weights. They don't care about all the weights all the time. But there are some learning algorithm like neural network, for example. Then you care about all the weights all the time because you you need to look at the ways to generate the uh, uh, forward backward pass. So for neural network, that these approaches only send selective barriers is not very effective because you, you need all the weights anyway, unless there's no significant updates in this round. Yeah. Okay, so for this lasso one, if a worker is working on a batch where none of the data in that batch touches this parameter, it Correct. doesn't work. Then you can move on, yes. Yeah. So, um, um, so you're considering significance sort of uh, on a per update basis. Yes. But you could imagine sort of accumulated significance over time. Sort of like we last synced up and the values were this. Right. And then I have a bunch of insignificant updates, but that leads me to a place where I've made a significant advance. That's right. And so then you could force a sync at that point. That is correct. So that is why we call it aggregated update. So the aggregate update won't, won't get reset. So it will keep accumulated. Even if it's a small, it will keep accumulating, accumulating until it reaches the point that's significant and it will communicate that way. Okay. Yeah. So in the extreme case, uh, some people here might be familiar with uh, sort of, uh, this one bit SGD trick that was developed right. here some time ago. Okay. Yeah. So this extreme case where you just, you know, you have this threshold and you're also sort of doing this accumulation. But in that approach, I think uh, it was very restrictive to one. Yeah it's, a, it's a binary, yeah, it's a binary decision, yeah. Okay, uh, so let's first look at the training time. So uh, so first we evaluate the setting that between Virginia and California, so it's within the same continent, wider network, and the y-axis is uh, training time. Uh, mm -hmm. So as we can see, compared to baseline, Gaia is much faster, and also very close performance to LAN, which is that we train the algorithm, uh, train the same algorithm with the preloaded data within a single data center. And we also uh, examine the setting where it's between Singapore and Sao Paulo. This is uh, the worst wire network pair we can find between uh, EC2 data centers. And we can see that in this challenging approach, we can still see that Gaia pretty much can close up the gap between lane and baseline. Even in the most challenging case where we're running image classification, we can see that Gaia can achieve more than 50 times speed up over baseline. It's very similar performance to LAN. And overall, uh, it's at most uh, 1.23 times of the LAN speeds. We also evaluate the cost of running this uh, on EC2. So here, we segment the cost into three parts. One is the communication cost of a wider network, and also the machine cost of waiting for network, and also the machine cost to do the compute. We first look at the metric factorization with different uh, wider wide network setting. Y axis is the cost. And we can see that uh, in all the settings, uh, Gaia is much cheaper, mostly because we eliminate a lot of communication costs in the time that waiting for the network. And it's pretty much the same with other applications as well. So overall, Gaia can achieve up to 59, uh, 59 times uh, uh, cheaper compared to baseline. So before I go go to the third work, I quickly summarize some key takeaways. Hold on, I mean, yeah. So it seems to me you, you missed an important output on this, which is you didn't tell us how much accuracy the models lose by doing this, as opposed to doing a local. Trial. There's no loss. So, no so loss yeah, so I I talk at the say at the beginning. So all the res reports results are reported based on the accuracy that we can achieve within the single single data center. Okay, so doing this training where, so like, if you say vary the, the threshold, the, you know, the communication threshold number, would you then start getting lost, or? At some point, it will, but we are reporting the threshold that doesn't. So if you make the threshold very high, say 50%, yeah. then obviously there will be some loss. But so there are two, two key insights that why it doesn't. So first is that uh, at the beginning of machine learning training, there are a lot of updates happening. And uh, at that time, even the threshold is high, uh, it's, still, it's still kind of fine because it's, we are not fine-tuning to the optimal point. And then at the, at the very end, obviously, it's very important that we find the optimal point. And, uh, but at that time, the learning rates are usually much smaller, which means the updates itself are much smaller, move, moving with much smaller updates. And we tune our threshold to make it smaller as well. So eventually, they will converge to the same point 
or similar points. We actually have some theoretical justification for that as well, for convex setting. But for non-convex setting, obviously, it's much harder to analyze. Uh, but for con convex setting, we actually setting. we have a theoretical proof for that. This actually works. Yeah. Yes? So for the non-convex setting, though, you have all these results are matching yeah. baseline accuracy. That's right. So th th these three are actually non-convex, all three. So talking modeling is not even whatever convex because it's unsupervised. And for metric factorization and image classification, they are non-convex at all. But we still see that the accuracy is still the same with uh, what we can achieve within single data center. So uh, how does it compare to this alternate baseline? In the alternate baseline, you don't have any coordination between the two data centers. You right. treat two entirely separate models. Right. And your model is, first, tell me which data center this data was generated closest to, and then apply that model. So. And it's a very good question. So, um, so, so that first of all, that depends on actually something I'm going to discuss very quickly. But data skew. But let's say there's no data skew, and we actually did that experiments with face recognition. So, uh, if we have the full data set, or part of the data set, or quarter of the data sets, we can see that the uh, performance actually drops significantly. Uh, so, it is important to have the view of the full data set. But on the other hand, if there's a major data skew, then there's a different story, which I'll, co I'll cover very soon. Yeah. Yes? Um, so your, your, your time is already very close to mine, so maybe this question is irrelevant. But uh, I'm wondering, like, could you just do all of this asynchronously? Like, could I just sort of apply updates to my server, and then in the background, it also swaps updates with other parameter servers, and they all kind of get jumbled together and applied. So I never actually have to block after I make an update, waiting to synchronize with some other machine. It's all kind of done asynchronously, and they all get mixed up. So that's, that's a model that's called total asynchronous uh, parallel. Uh, that's actually work for the uh, thing Hog Wild uh, that, that does exactly that. But that actually been proven that only works for certain algorithms. For example, for neural net, it just doesn't work at all. Uh, because you suffer in precision. And yeah, yeah, and you just diverge very quickly. Yeah. Actually, so even within a local data center cluster, yeah. if you run ASP, which is this model where you're not blocking and communicating, uh, there has been work from others that have shown this too, but we've also got results showing that BSP is actually much better. Because you've seen this divergence in the Yeah. Okay. One more question. Yeah. Um, so at the beginning, when you're giving a justification for this, you gave two justifications. Yeah. One is you didn't want to centralize the data, and the second one is that there's some legal. <coughs> That's right. right. I totally buy the second one. Those are. I mean, we suffer under GDPR all the time. Right. Um, but for the first one, um, how does the total of data transferred for your system compare to just centralizing? Very good question. I have the slide for that. Yeah. <coughs> yes. <laughs> Good. So yeah, so we actually do the comparison. So compared to a centralized approach. Uh, so this is actually the speed. So if it's more than, yeah, it's over centralized. So, uh, right. So if it's more than one, that means that uh, Gaia is faster, right? And uh, there's a cost ratio as well. So you can see that if we, if we only look at the cost part, then it's, it is uh, it is true that uh, centralized. Oh, sorry, hold on. So it's it's it's, moving. it's over. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So um, it runs faster sometimes, but it's moving more data. Is that what yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So so the only reason to do this is a mirror scenario too, which is GDPR is preventing or something. That will make more sense, but. Uh, but that also depends on, actually, I think the data set size and the model, you know, how many iterations you have to run. So it's a function of that. But we only evaluate three. So you can imagine in cases where uh, the model is relatively small compared to the uh, data, then it will make more sense even the, on the cost. Yeah, that's true. Yes. Right. Yeah. The model size doesn't scale. Right. Okay. Okay. So to summarize, uh, we can see that this highly distributed and rapidly growing data can be very challenging for both machine learning serving and training. And our approach is we design machine learning systems that take advantage of some characteristics of machine learning, such as the algorithm. For example, Gaia, we see that the updates are not significant most of the time. 
or machine learning model structures, like the type K results or the feature layer of these cheap CNNs, or the training serving data characteristics. For example, there are some, sim some similarities in videos. So we can see that by using this approach, we can uh, reduce latency and cost of machine learning serving and training by one to two orders of magnitude. Other than uh, machine learning systems, I'm also interested in uh, computer architecture problems. So I also made contributions for processing memory, including two projects that I led, and also cross-layer abstractions for both CPUs and GPUs, and also DRAM systems as well. I'll be more than happy to talk about these projects with you if you're interested. So now I'm going to quickly go through our ongoing effort that I work with Amar for the SKU data sets. So most literatures in machine learning distributed training assume that data is randomly distributed. However, it's just not true for the real world data sets. For example, face recognition. The face will actually determine on, determined by the demographics of different countries. So it can skew over space. And also it can skew over time as well. At different time, we have different demographics and different compositions of the data. So the question we want to ask is what will happen to machine learning if the data is skewed over time or space? So first we look at the space and we do a comprehensive characterizations with different machine learning applications, with different decentralized learning approaches, and different kind of skewed, uh, data skewness. Uh, so here I'm going to show results with image classification and face recognition, and we're doing other more. And I studied three decentralized learning approaches, including Gaia and other two very popular uh, decentralized learning approaches that reduce communication overhead. The way that we create skewed data is essentially, we, for example, image classification, we put different uh, image class to different places. Uh, face recognition is the same. We put the pictures of different people in different places. Um, to see how these skewed data affect the model quality, we look at this particular example, Google Net over Cypher 10. So the y-axis is top one validation accuracy, which is the, you can see it as the model quality. And for the shuffle data, we can see that for all four, uh, all three uh, decentralized approach, they match the accuracy with BSP very well. It's exactly the same. However, if it's skewed data, the story is totally different. For all three approaches, there's a major uh, accuracy drop with them. In another word, uh, all these uh, existing de decentralized learning approaches don't really consider this uh, setting, and they can lose significant accuracy with, by dealing with this kind of data. On the other hand, BSP, which is uh, we, con we communicate everything all the time, it can be accurate, but it will be too slow if the communication is a bottleneck. We observe the same results across the board. For example, different neural network with the same data sets, we can see the same results with skewed data. We also tried it with different data sets, ImageNet, and it's pretty much the same results. We also try with uh, different applications, face recognition, they're using different, very different kind of validation scheme, but the results is pretty much the same. So essentially this problem is actually pervasive and very fundamental for machine learning training, especially for those decentralized learning approaches. And what makes it worse is that actually for certain neural network, even using BSP cannot solve this problem. For example, ResNet, uh, that, uh, we can see that even BSP lose some significant accuracy. And our study shows that uh, it's actually the neural networks with batch normalization layers that have this problem. So the immediate direction that we are looking at is how to solve this problem. So the idea we have is that since those decentralized learning approaches maintain different model at different places, we can actually do a periodical model traveling, which move model from one place to another. And we can use the training data in a, in a new data center to test the quality of this uh, new the model. And then we can learn if there is some accuracy gap between uh, different models at different places. We can use that as a, a, a proxy to see how, data, how much data is skewed. And also we can learn another thing, which is which data samples are creating these accuracy drops. And then we can do two things. In the case where uh, by low constraint we cannot move the data, we can tighten the communication uh, based on the skewness or accuracy drop that we learn. And the other thing we can do is that, let's say if data movement is possible, then we can do selective data shuffling. It's like active learning. So we can pick the data samples that we think are creating issues for, for my data center so that uh, we can uh, be more communication efficient and then do this training with the skewed data. And we're also looking for solutions for neural networks with uh, normalizations as well. 
And obviously, this is the simplest case, right? So there are other cases where the data can also skew over space and time at the same time. So we are looking at uh, interested in the direction where it's continuous learning, that we keep learning distributedly, but the data can skew over time. So we need to be able to detect uh, when the data change, and then incrementally and efficiently update the model. Because we don't want to retrain the model when the data is changed. But at the same time, we don't want to lose what we have learned with this old model. And also, we, we want to tailor to the application requirement, because some, some application will be interested in more recent data. Some application will be interested in the global knowledge of all the data that we have seen. And the other thing, actually, there's a question that was asked by Jay as well, that the trade-off between local model versus global model, right? Because sometimes it's actually more, making more sense to just train the local model, and then because it works much better for the skilled data anyway, right? Uh, so. Uh, the question we are going to ask is, is it possible to train global model and local model at the same time? So one, one idea that we, are, we can look at is the idea called multitask learning. Essentially, for example, you can think of a neural net. You can train the bottom layers globally, so leverage the data everywhere. But the top layers, we can specialize for different places. So we can do this training at the same time. And we can use the same idea or potentially other ideas, but uh, it has to also change over time. So there's another dimension we have to look at. And looking even down the road, uh, I'm also interested in different machine learning uh, paradigms like reinforcement learning, auto ML, which search the neural network architecture automatically for, for, for a set of training data and see how they play with uh, rapid growing, distributed, and skilled data. For example, reinforcement learning, it's not clear how we can build a communication efficient reinforcement learning system and that adapts to uh, skilled data over space and time. Because reinforcement learning usually assumes that you can go and simulate uh, your model, with, get some reward, and then use it to come back and do the training. But if the, the data is spread across different places, so you will get different reward at different time. Then how do we uh, deal with that? And also, uh, obviously, change over time is another problem. Auto ML, on the other hand, uh, we usually need to explore many, many models to achieve the optimal model, which means that we need to run the same training for, not the same training, but run the training for maybe hundreds or even thousands of times. Then uh, the questions that Bill just asked to make more sense, right? Like, then why not just centralize the data? But let's say if we cannot do that, then we need a more cost-efficient approach. The idea, one idea is that we can train some local model uh, with different places and then try, try to find a way to merge this model uh, and then find a way to do that. And the other uh, direction is that how does these uh, decent decentralized learning approaches uh, interact with AutoML? Because with AutoML, we don't even know if a certain model will converge, right? But we also use this communication efficient approach that may create other problems for accuracy as well. So there's another dimension that we have to figure out. But if we don't use those approaches, the latency will be just unbearable, right? So there is a, a trade-off between cost, latency, and accuracy. So that's another interesting direction that I'm interested in. OK. So with this, uh, I would like to acknowledge all my co-authors throughout the years. Uh, thank you. Um, I'll be glad to take any more questions. So you propose some uh, ways to take advantage of your knowledge of spatial and time. Why not use the machine learning model, the machine learning training, to figure that out automatically by providing as one feature the time that the data was collected or the data center that the data was collected at? Uh, I'm not sure about the question. So are you saying well, just... So, it, I mean, to my mind, machine learning algorithms are panaceas that can learn anything, and maybe they could learn... Uh, the 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 result the the the, uh, the way that the model should change based on depending on what data center the data was collected in and or what region of the world and the time it was collected in. So why not just let the machine learning model do its thing by just supplying as one additional feature on on each data on each datum add one more feature saying this is the place part of the world it was collected in another feature saying this is the time it was collected in and just let the ML algorithm figure out the, the spatial and temporal uh, dependency. Okay, so there are uh, good questions. So for the uh, for the space part, um, so if we are interested in training specialized model uh, for different places, that approach may work. But there are cases where we just want to leverage data at different places um, that. 
Um, so it's not so important that where this data comes from, but it's more important about what's the content of the data and how can we leverage that data. Uh, so even adding a feature point uh, to the neural network may not actually help. On the time, so actually time is very challenging because machine learning training is that we begin with some random model and we already converge to a certain model at, at some point, right? So at that point, moving uh, a model is not as simple as, you know, just getting some more data in and then you can, you know, restart. Because you have to consider if we move out of that optimal point, then how about the old data, right? This, there's actually a term for it, it's called uh, catastrophic uh, interference, that we, we learn f for the new things, but we forget about the old things, right? So uh, it's a very interesting problem. And uh, some people are working on that as well, like creating memory in neural network and, you know, doing some different kind of things. But it's still a very uh, new area. I was, uh, sorry, it's not a new area. It had been proposed like in 1980s, but there are a lot of uh, recent work they're working on neural network with uh, catastrophic interference. And it's just, it's just one problem of that, right? The other problem is how do we even uh, update the model that we can efficiently reach a new optimal point that without uh, sort of consider all the data, right? without retraining everything. Well, if not, I, I think a lot, of, a lot of you are actually meeting him one-on-one, -on -one, so uh, well, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.